So appreciate your flexibility and all that as well. We're working it. Some things happen. But right now, a man who needs no introduction. Uh, Larry, come on up. <laughs> Evidently. Can you all hear me okay? Everybody in the back, can you hear me? Evidently, I need no introduction. <laughs> all right, I'm going to... My name's Larry, Larry Allison, and uh, they gave me this clicker, and we'll see how good I am at this. All right. So, um, let's start with prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you all the glory. We thank you, Father, that you sent your son, Jesus, so that we can spend eternity with you. We thank you, Father, that he paid the price that we couldn't pay, that he made the sacrifice we couldn't make. And we thank you, Father, for all eternity that we have with you. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. All right, today we're going to talk a little bit about the ancient world before Adam and Eve. And let me just say this, there is no way in 45 minutes we're going to be able to get all of the scriptures in and be able to give you everything that's the full proof. But what I want to let you know is if for some reason you would like to have my notes with the scriptures, you can have them. And all you need to do is just email me at l o m at Allison, my last name, O-L-L-I-S-O-N dot org, and just say that you would like to have the notes of the ancient world before Adam and Eve, and we will send them to you in a PDF file. How's that? Wonderful. If you're a reader and you would like to know more about this, we have a book called The Paradise of God, which touches on these things, and it talks uh, extensively more than what I'm able to talk right now. So let's get started. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. We need to understand this. What I'm presenting to you today is very interesting. Uh, it's, it's my personal belief, but here's the thing we need to understand. We are not to argue about this, and it is not salvation critical. You need to understand that whether you agree with me today or not, it does not affect your salvation. Your salvation is based upon your relationship with Jesus Christ, not about whether you agree or disagree with Larry Allison. Sound man, if you could dub in some applause there, I would appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Now, uh, we understand that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is a picture of the earliest light forms out there, and scientists uh, say that this is from several billion years ago. Now, it's the radiation, and this is how they measure it, and when I mention the word science, some people just cringe, and, and they say, whoa, wait a minute, science doesn't have anything to do with the Bible. But we need to understand this, that there's true science, I said true science, and there's true Bible. And true science and true Bible actually do fit together. Now, I personally am not a, a scientist. I did stay at a Holiday Inn once. But my, my, wife's, my wife's grandfather, he worked on the Apollo program. And several times we went down to uh, where they were manufacturing the capsules, and he showed us inside the little wiring diagrams that he did. So... I'm not opposed to science, but just like with news, there's fake news, there's also fake science. But we need to understand this, that uh, let's take a look at Second Peter here. For this they willingly forget, that by the word of God, the heavens, notice that's plural, heavens, were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed. Now, we are living in, right now, the world that does exist. But here is a hint that Peter mentioned 
about the world that then existed. It perished being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. In the beginning, God created the heavens. Now, your Bible may say heaven, but it's actually heaven. It's Barashit bara Elohim et Hashemim Haaretz uh, in the Hebrew, and it's heavens, plural. Now, when we talk about heavens, the first heaven is the atmosphere that we, we breathe. And so many times the Bible talks about that heaven. In fact, in Revelation, when it talks about the new heaven and the new earth, it's talking about that heaven, the, the, the atmosphere that encompasses us. But we also know that there's more than one heaven. Remember, Paul said that he went to the third heaven. Yeah. You remember that? And he went to the paradise of God. Well, the word paradise is also the same word for, uh, in Hebrew and Greek as orchard or garden. So when the Bible talks about the garden of God, it's talking about the paradise of God, the orchard of God. And so remember, Paul said, I went there. He said, whether I was in my body, I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe not. But this one thing I do know, I went there. And then later he said, I'd rather be there than here. Amen. Oh, that's powerful. And then he said, and I'm paraphrasing this, he's talking to his followers. He said, but because of you knuckleheads, I have to stay. <laughs> so, uh, but in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, we need to understand that when, there's so many things in the Bible that are interesting. Uh, when he created the heavens, all of the heavens and the earth, we need to understand that the Bible talks about an area beyond the heavens. And I've always read this verse all my life as uh, he who ascended, ascended into heaven. But what it says is he who descended is also the one who ascended where? Far beyond, far above all the heavens. And there's a couple places that talk about this, that there's an area beyond the heavens. And I thought, well, you know, that would really be nice if the Bible would tell us what's beyond the heavens. And there are scriptures, more than one, that talk about beyond the heavens is the glory of God. So we can feel confident that our entire universe is encapsulated. Are you following me here? Is encapsulated by the glory of God. So God has a hand on your life. He knows what's going to take place in your life. You know, we need to understand that God himself created time. Time is uh, something, and, and I, we have verses that prove that in the scripture. God created time for us. And so often when we look at time, we're kind of like people sitting in an intersection watching a train go by, and we see this car go by, and each car could be like a day or a year. We, we see it go by, and then the next one comes up, and we see it go by. And we, we can't see how far down the track the caboose is. We can't see how far down the track the engine is. All we're seeing is just a car each day going by. But God is outside of time. And so God is looking at this. It's kind of like being in a helicopter, eight or 10,000 feet above the earth. And you're there, and you're seeing the very same train. But you can look over here, and you can see the ending of it. You can see the begin, beginning of it, and you, you see it all. Now... God doesn't predestine us in such a way that he controls us. And that's very hard for some people to grasp. But, but the reality is, is God knows our future without affecting our choice in the future. And in his name, the I am, in his name, uh, if you study that out in the Hebrew, it's I was, I am, I will be, but it is all now. With God, there's just now. Yep. Everything is now. So he who descended also is the one who ascended far above all the heavens. We need to also understand that the world we're living in is the created world. The real world is the spirit world. I have people say to me from time to time, boy, I just wish I could get back to reality. Well, reality is the spirit world. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. 
Now, we can take a look at a scripture here. In Isaiah, it says, For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who established it, who did not create it in vain. Now, if I got my buttons right here, I think I can go back. Okay. The earth was without form and void. Remember, in the first verse it says, God created the heavens and the earth. When God creates something, it's perfect. Amen. When God creates something, it's perfect. Then the next verse says, and the earth was without form and void. That word without form and void in the Hebrew is tohu, is two Hebrew words, tohu vavohu. Yep. Now, the best way to describe that is if a Jewish mother goes in and she cleans up her son's bedroom and has it perfect. And then her son goes in and she comes back two hours later and she goes in and looks at it. It's tohu vabohu. Okay. So what that means is it was perfect. Are you following me? It was perfect and it became chaotic. And so that's what it's telling us in Genesis 1, 1. God created the heavens and the earth perfect. And in Isaiah, it tells us that he did not create the earth tohu. When it says he did not create it in vain, he did not create it tohu. He created it perfect. But the earth became formless and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So who was there in the beginning? God the Father, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. And then in John 1.1, 1, 1, it's interesting that John came out with this. He said, in the beginning was the Word. Yes. In the beginning, so Jesus was there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. And nothing was made that was made unless it was made by the Word. And then in verse 14, if you drop down there, it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So who do we have in the beginning? We have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. See, here it is. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in tohu. He did not. It's the same Hebrew word there. He did not create it in vain. So God said, let there be light. And there was light. Well, we know that the, the sun and the moon are, they weren't exposed until the fourth day. So what was God saying there when he said, let there be light? Basically, he was saying, I'm here. Amen. <laughs> I'm here. E.A. Or. Uh, he said, in the, probably the best translation is light be. Well, what is light? The Bible tells us God is light. So God showed up. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Now, we know when it says God is light, light actually travels at 299,792,458 meters per second. Or that's around approximately 186,000 miles per second. Well, God is not photons. He is a spiritual light. All right? So, when did this happen? Well, and God saw the light and it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and he called the light day, and the darkness he called night, so the evening and the morning were the first day. Uh, in my opinion, what was created on the first day, in my opinion, is absolutely nothing. God just showed up. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters, Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, so the evening and the morning were the second day. Did he create the waters and the firmament that day? Did he create them that day? No, he divided them. All right. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, now follow me on this. Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind whose seed 
is in itself on the earth. So did he create the seed that day? No, it's telling us here that the seed was already in the earth. It was already here. So how could it be here unless there had to be something happen between the time that God created the heavens and the earth perfect and the earth became formless and void? And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and so evening and morning were the third day. One thing that you're going to find all through the Scripture, it's a spiritual principle of God, is that he wants everything to reproduce after its own kind. Everything should reproduce after its own kind. And one of the big problems is when people try to change lanes. Are you following me? Yes. You're going down this lane and you say, I'd rather be in that lane. God says, don't change lanes. Amen. Now, we could go into the scriptures, and, and, and like I say, I have so many more scriptures than I have time to give you today. But we could go into the book of Hebrews, and it talks about angels and why they were created. Now, angels were created, it says, to help, to assist the saints of God. Amen. Angels were not created to be like God. Angels were not created, they were created to worship and to assist those who are called of God. That's the lane they're supposed to be in. We were created in the likeness and image of God. We're, we were created to look like him and to act like him. And according to Scripture, and we'll talk more about this on Sunday when we talk about the rapture of the church, but according to Scripture, when we receive our glorified bodies, our resurrected glorified bodies, we will have a body like the body that Jesus has. And according to Scripture, like what he's going to have through all eternity. Remember what he did? You know, he uh, appeared in rooms that were, were locked. Wow, I mean, he, he moved at the speed of thought. He ate fish on the Sea of Galilee. Now, Mondo and I are taking a group to Israel here in a couple weeks. And I've been to Israel enough times, I don't even know how many times I've been there. But I will tell you this, I've had fish at the Sea of Galilee, and I really don't see how Jesus stomached it. It was, it was awful. They served it to you. The, the head was still on it. They call it Peter's Fish House. And it's like they just took a, a, an old fish like we have at the Lake of the Ozarks, and they just kind of like threw it on a grill and just burn it. But I shouldn't complain because if Jesus liked it, I should like it too. All right. But here's, here's what we find. Lucifer, and we'll, we may get to this in a few moments, but Lucifer was created. Angels did not always exist. They were created. Now, we see that they weren't created during the six days of creation. And when Adam and Eve were in the garden, angels had already existed and Satan had already fallen. All right? So something happened before then, but Lucifer's biggest problem is that he tried to get out of his lane. You know, the Scripture doesn't say that he wanted to be God. It says he wanted to be like God. Well, don't you think it's almost in your face when God created mankind in his likeness and in his image? That probably ruffled a few feathers with Lucifer, although I'm not saying Lucifer had feathers. <laughs> you know, <laughs> sometimes people take what you say so literal. In Isaiah 14, 12, we find, How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. Now, now follow me on this. If he fell before Adam and Eve were in the garden, what nations is it talking about? Hello? Something must have been going on. Now, I have four granddaughters, and all of them, when they were little, they all asked me this question. <laughs> they said, Grandpa, 
Why did God create the devil? I mean, he's such a problem. Why did God create him? And I had to remind them, God didn't create the devil. He created Lucifer, who the scripture tells us was perfect in all of his ways. But he gave Lucifer and all of the angels the same thing he has given us, and that is freedom of choice. God's not looking for AI to worship him. He's not looking for robots. He's not looking for Siri or Alexa. I mean, I, let me tell you, he's looking for beings that have chosen to worship him. Wow, praise God. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also set on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. See, he didn't even say he was going to overthrow God. He just said he wanted to be like God. Well, that wasn't his lane. Angels weren't created to be like God. And you need to understand this. You're not an angel. Now, Bob Ulrich and Mondo, they're good friends. Uh, we're on the board together at Prophecy Watchers. But let me tell you something. Bob and Mondo are not angels. <laughs> and I've been around them long enough to know that they have never been. And I can tell you from Scripture, they never will be. You know, you're not... Don't get your theology. And here's part of the problem in the church. A lot of the church is getting its theology from Hollywood. They're getting their, and they're, they're thinking about things like Clarence. You know, trying to get his wings by doing something good. <clears throat> okay, moving right along. Yet you shall be brought down to shield to the lowest depths of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you. And consider you saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms? So when he was cast down, there were kingdoms. Well, if you have kingdoms, you have a king. You've got boundaries. Who made the world a, as a wilderness, destroyed its cities? Hello? Look what it says in Jeremiah. I beheld the earth. And indeed, it was without form and void. So when's it talking about? It's talking about when the earth became without form and void. And the heavens, they had no light. So this is a time before God stepped up and said, light be. I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled, and all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, and indeed there was no man. So man had not been created yet. Now let me make this perfectly clear before we go any further, and I probably should have already said this. Adam was the first man. If there was a civilization, and there was, according to Scripture, if there was a civilization before Adam and Eve, it was not mankind. It may have been angel kind. It may have been what we would call alien kind of some sort. But it was not mankind because Adam was the first man. But I beheld, and indeed there was no man, and the birds of the heaven had fled. Now, if you go back to the days of creation where man was created, you're going to find out that the birds were created before man. All right? But here it says, the birds of the heaven had fled and there was no man. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness, and all its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. Look at this here. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God and the heavenly Jerusalem to an innumerable company of angels. How many angels are there? You know, mathematically, scripturally, it can be figured out and it's in the trillions. So if you have trillions of angels, we know that one third of the angels followed Satan. Now, I know this almost sounds like an oxymoron, but he was a good liar. You know, Jesus said in John 8, 44, that Satan was a liar, and he always had been from the beginning, that there's no truth found in him. So evidently, he was proficient enough in his lies that he convinced one-third of the heavenly host that had been with the Lord for eons of time, he convinced them that somehow he was a better leader. And after he convinced them of that and he led his rebellion, God cast him and those angels to the earth. 
But this is letting us know that there are different lanes. In, in the heavenly Jerusalem, there's going to be the saints of God in their glorified bodies, and there's going to be angels. Once again, I don't, it doesn't matter what your church teaches in this regard or your denomination. When you die, you do not get wings. Okay? You're not going to be floating around in heaven with either a bow, you know, You know, you're not going to be floating around heaven with, with, with a bow and a little diaper on. <laughs> okay. Look at this in Ezekiel. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up lamentation against the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection. And this is talking prophetically about Lucifer. You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, remember? The Garden of Eden. And in, in my book, The Paradise of God, we talk about the four different places that the Garden of Eden has been shown in the Bible. It's really an interesting study. You were in Eden, the Garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, emerald with gold. The workmanship of your temples and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. We need to understand this. There was a day Lucifer was created. The day before he was created, he didn't exist. But God did. I said, but God did. And look, what, what, what if, what if science is right in what they believe right now? And I'm not saying they are or they aren't, but from a singularity 13.8 billion years ago, out of nothing, there was a spark, and that spark created an explosion that moved faster than the speed of light, and all of a sudden, our universe started appearing. Well, let me ask you this. If that happened 13.8 billion years ago, what about 13.9 billion years ago? Where was God? God was still here. And for all we know, we're just one spark. Who's to say that God doesn't have, have a, a hundred thousand universes? I got real quiet in this Baptist church here. <laughs> but see, if we say that can't happen, we're limiting God. See, and, and what, what about God's word? He tells us what we need to know so that we can spend all eternity with him. Wow, this is good stuff. I hope I didn't lose too many of you with that. Oh, sorry, I thought I saw a tomato. <laughs> you were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth amidst the fiery stones. That's an interesting teaching. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in him. And that iniquity that was found in him was his choice. By the abundance of your trading. So not only did we have cities and kingdoms and kings and boundaries, but evidently there was commerce. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence from within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub. Now, does it say in the Bible that Satan was an archangel? Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of writings, but what I've tried to do today is I'm keeping all of this in Scripture. Does that mean I don't read the book of Enoch or Jasher and all? The, no, no, I, I have them in my library. I use them as a reference, but I use the Bible as Scripture. Are you following me? So in the Bible, Lucifer is, was not considered an archangel. He was a cherub. And remember the cherubim over the Ark of the Covenant? Remember, the, well, there was an Ark of the Covenant on, on earth, and then there was the Ark of the Covenant in heaven that had been there from, for eons of time. And in Hebrews, it tells us how when Jesus, on the day he resurrected, he went into heaven itself, and he put his blood on the mercy seat, which is the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, and at that moment, he became the perfect sacrifice, the firstborn among many brethren, the perfect lamb that was slain, and he came back to earth with his glorified body, and for 40 days he taught his disciples and family. Uh, it's, it's just amazing. 
Um, but you know, what, what's, <laughs> what's interesting about that Ark of the Covenant is that it's, it had never had blood placed on it before. You know, the Bible even tells us that the one that Indiana Jones carried around and, you know, here on earth, that that was a copy. And, and it actually uses that word in Hebrews. It says, the one on earth that was made by human hands, the one that when Moses went up onto the mountain and God gave him the instructions on how to make the ark, that's the one made with human hands. But Jesus put his blood on an altar in heaven on the day of his resurrection. Tells about it in Hebrews that had never had blood on it before. It didn't have the blood of bulls and goats on it. And his perfect blood was placed on the perfect altar. And at that moment, the church was born. And everyone who believed in him, everyone who believed in him, received everlasting life from that point on. You know, it's interesting when he, a, a few days later, now when he came back to earth that day, he appeared in a locked room, but Thomas wasn't there. And... Uh, then a few days later, he appeared in that same locked room because the disciples were all hunkering in the bunker. They were afraid they were going to get crucified next, you know. So they were hiding. And Jesus said to Thomas, he said, handle me, touch me, see that I am not flesh and bone. Now, back in the day, it was common even in the Hebrew language, in the Greek language, to say flesh and blood, just like we do right now. We say flesh and blood. But he said flesh and bone. Why did he not say flesh and blood? Because he had been to that altar in heaven and had already placed his blood on the altar. And now he was in his glorified body. Now this is strictly opinion. All right? I want to make that clear. But I feel that when we have our glorified bodies, that instead of having blood running through our veins, we have the glory of God running through our veins. And that sustains us in our glorified bodies forever and ever and ever. Amen. Wow. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. So if you're a real pretty person, be careful. <laughs> you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. See, right there again, it's talking about commerce. By the iniquity of your trading, therefore I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. There was somebody there watching. He doesn't say in, in my sight. He said in the sight of all who watch you. Wow. Now, here's what Jesus said. And I said to them, I saw. He didn't say, I will see. He said, I saw. Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Well, we already established in the beginning was the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus saw this happen. Now, I'm a pilot, okay, and if, for how many of you are pilots? Oh, there's quite a few of you. Well, you know that there's a difference between magnetic north and real north, and the earth is off of its axis just a little bit. Now, this is another opinion. I, I believe, I my best guess is that when Satan was cast to the earth with all of the fallen angels, if you take a cherub of God and literally billions of angels and they are cast to the earth like lightning and they hit this earth, my opinion is, is that is what caused this earth to become formless and void. That's what took it off of its axis. And somebody say, well, could just an angel falling down, being cast down? Jesus said, like lightning, 186,000 miles per second. Well, down in Mexico, there's a crater that's miles across that was hit by an asteroid. And then they have the asteroid that hit it, and it's just like about that big. It's not very big. And he say, well, how could an, something that small make a crater this big? And they say, it's not the size, it's the velocity. So my thought is when... Satan was cast down. It really messed things up here on the earth. Okay. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. As Christians, we need to get our eyes off of what we see and get our eyes on to what God says. Amen. 
You know, there's a scripture, Paul said this, he said, we walk by faith and not by sight. Well, the simplest, we know that faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen, but the simplest definition of faith is just believing God. Believing God. So we need to walk by believing God instead of what we see. And here's the thing. When we see one thing, and it's contrary to what God says, we need to believe what God says instead of what we see. Because according to Jesus, what we believe is what we receive. You know, the entire world, whether we want to admit it or not, Adolf Hitler and Mussolini and, and uh, you know, politicians, uh, Jesus, <laughs> Jesus died for all of them. But is everybody saved? Is everybody born again? No. There's a qualifier. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him. Yes. See, so he's paid the price for everyone, but it's only what we believe that we receive. Okay, that's just another version. For sake of time, we will, we will go past that and that. Let me tell you something. God loves you. And in this ancient past, what we need to learn from this, it's not good to rebel with God. And even if you can get one-third of the people to agree with you, don't rebel from God. You know, Jesus said that there's only one way to the Father, and that one way was through Jesus himself. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the light. And sometimes we can be criticized for studying these types of things. Uh, you know, you're here at this conference, sometimes people say, well, why do we even need to know about AI? Why do we need to know about UFOs? Why, who, who cares about the ancient earth? Who cares? Well, here's the thing. If it's in the Bible, God wants us to study it. And he says, study to show yourself approved. Study. And the Bible talks about all these things. You know, I uh, had a, a teaching a, a few months ago about UFOs in the Bible. And there were people who got upset who didn't even listen to it. Because they just got upset over UFOs in the Bible being in one sentence. We, we need to take the full word of God. And I think if we understood that there's secrets and nuggets about all of these things that we question. Yes. About all of these things. So, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like the rapture. I, uh, I received an email this morning. This person said, okay, you're a liar. Uh, that's a nice way to start out a letter. He said, he, said, he said, I heard you say, I heard you say that when we die, that we go to be with the Lord. I heard you say that. And then I heard you say, you were reading from some book, Thessalonica something or other. He said, you were reading from that book, and he said, and you, then you said Jesus was coming back to get us. Well, if when we die we go to be with Jesus, we're already there. Why is he coming back to get us? You know, and see, and that just comes from a, a lack of understanding of the principles in the Word of God. We are a three-part being. According to 1 Thessalonians 5.23, we're spirit, soul, and body. And we need to understand that we don't have the same path for all three. You know? And if you want to hear all about what I just said, you need to come back Sunday morning. <laughs> but uh, God loves you. I love you. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What we do know from the scripture is that there was a civilization before Adam and Eve. Was it man? No, it wasn't man because Adam was the first man. But there was trading, there were cities, there were kingdoms, they were on the earth, and Lucifer was cast down into them. And then God said, let us make man in our image. Wow. See, and that's another subject there too. Let us make man in our image. Well, I guess now you just got to buy the book.
dub in some more laughter and humor there because... <laughs> I, uh, sometimes I feel like when I'm speaking at a conference or even at my own church, that it, when, it, when I near the end and I start saying, this is my last verse, I think that that music comes up in a lot of people's hearts. <laughs> Hallelujah. God bless you all. I love you.